Can you refresh the slideshow one more time? Uh, yes. Okay. Hello to anybody that's uh, joining us filing in. We're just um, going to get started in a few minutes here. Um, feel free to type in the chat or, or type questions or comments in the chat and we can uh, get to those during the Q&A at the end. Just uh, great to have you. And Um, I'm going to go ahead and start the uh, Facebook live stream uh, just, just so that we have that going. Um, awesome. So you guys can still, you know, talk, but now we're going to be broadcasting on Facebook too. So here goes. Awesome, it worked. So probably there's nobody watching on Facebook quite yet, but hello anyway to the Facebook folks. Um, we're gonna get started here in a few minutes.
Just hello one more time. It looks like some more folks have joined us. Uh, we're going to get started in just a couple of minutes here. Um, if you're hearing this, it means that your sound is working. So <laughs> you're in great shape. Um, and yeah, we're just going to get started uh, real shortly. Alrighty. Well, that's um, that. It's seven o'clock, so um, we should go ahead and get started. I think uh, Dan, were you going to kick things off? Or? Yeah, I can. Uh, I just want to thank everyone uh, for joining us tonight for this wonderful program, and I especially want to thank our presenters uh, for taking uh, time this evening to be with us and um, sharing with us as well. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to go over a quick uh, couple upcoming events we have at the library after this program. Uh, so on the 4th of November, we have our Mystery Book Club at 5. On November 7th, we have our teen book discussion over the book The Voting Booth by Brandy Colbert. Uh, on the 11th, uh, Shanna Smith Schmidt will be giving an author talk at, with the library at 7. And on the 12th, uh, Nathan will be presenting uh, a tech talk over shopping websites. Um, and at 4.30 on the 12th as well, we'll be having a drive-by uh, celebration for Marianne, our director who will be retiring later this year. Um, so you can drive by the library and wave at her and wish her the best uh, as she moves on. Uh, so I will uh, pass it over to uh, Andy to introduce us while I get the, and I'll get the slides up. Uh, thanks, Dan, and thanks to both uh, Sam and Dan who have been managing all the technological aspects of this uh, panel session that we're going to be doing. And they also initiated this whole collaborative adventure, so we uh, appreciate that very much. Thanks, guys. Um, each of the panelists that we'll hear from this evening, we have three, they'll each share their thoughts about specific artifacts found in the Sorting Out Race exhibit. And the Sorting Out Race exhibit is up at Kaufman Museum right now and will be up through November 29. At this point, we are open all our regular hours. Um, we've been closed off and on a few times, but right now we're open and the hours and admission fees are all on our website. Uh, the Sorting Out Race exhibit was initiated when the manager uh, of the Etc. shop, who's one of our speakers tonight, uh, manager at our local thrift shop, the Etc. shop downtown, began holding items out and not putting them out on the sales floor. Um, the items she held out were ones that portrayed racial stereotypes. Uh, she then approached staff members at Kaufman Museum wondering whether that original collection of items might be the basis for an exhibit on racism and racial stereotypes. Uh, we said be, we'd be open to that, that and to creating an exhibit and the, plan, the planning continued from there. And uh, this evening, like I said, we'll hear from three different people and we'll introduce them as we go along. First off, we'll hear from Cheryl Wilson, and she is the director of the Kansas Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution. And before Cheryl begins, I'd like to take a moment uh, to acknowledge the original 
inhabitants of the lands where we now live. We recognize that both the Newton Public Library and Kaufman Museum stand on the prairie where many original people hunted and farmed before the arrival of American and European settlers, and in particular, the Wichita, Kaw, and the Osage lived here. And as you live and work in Newton, Kansas, or wherever you may live, uh, we ask that you honor the contributions of the Native Americans um, that used to live here and commit to respecting their descendants and learning about their rich cultural heritage. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Cheryl. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm pleased to be here and thank you all for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, I'll say that um, just my connection to this um, exhibit um, is one where I got to go visit um, the exhibit when it went to Wichita, I believe that was last year. And um, I remember going to the African American History Museum and it was shortly before the exhibit was leaving. Um, and I was so grateful to have had time to walk through and I got a personal <laughs> personalized tour from uh, the uh, people who were at the museum at the time. And I was very grateful for that. Um, I really, um, I had never conceptualized the idea of so many of the different, um, the, the different pieces that I saw, some of them were actually things that I remember from my childhood that I wouldn't have thought much of but obviously, and I, I take this from Maya Angelou, she says, when you know better, you do better. And I really do believe that um, as people have begun to, people of color have begun to speak out about things that um, basically put them in a stereotypical frame, um, people have taken note. So I, I think it's, it's really wonderful to hear how, and, and I'm, I'm pleased to be a part of this panel, especially um, hearing how this was conceptualized and I want to hear more, but just um, the idea that it's not just something that just gets passed on to a, a place where, you know, maybe people get it, maybe people don't. Um, so I'm pleased to have an, an, op an opportunity to share some of the pieces that resonated with me. And I'm just going to share my screen here. And um, I will I think it will go. All right. Well, oh. I'll best lay plans. It was up the way I wanted it. There. I apologize. Can't get it to do what I want it to do. You want it to just play? Yeah, I or was enlarge just... it or enlarge it. There's the little icon down at the bottom. Um over to the right. Yeah, I can. Oh, here you go. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. That'll Thank work. you. Thank you. Um, so the first slide I have has to do with blackface. And um, I saw this picture in um, one of the um, uh, curios and it, resonated with me um, because 
what is what we're seeing now is a resurgence of people's pictures in blackface and really not that long ago um, for some uh, people who um, don't really know the history of blackface. There are still people who are, um, you know, just in recent years have done uh, different, uh, mostly at Halloween have been out in blackface, but they wouldn't necessarily equate it to this particular uh, look, but just people who um, tend to look at something, someone and other them is, is kind of what I think about when I look at this, that this was a situation where the African-American community was othered and, and put in a position of not really um, understanding um, the, the white people not really understanding whom they were depicting and they put themselves in these very um, bodacious, very uh, just these very broad ways of being and always this kind of menstrual way of music or um, and the broken English and all of those things and the ways that they spoke when they uh, depicted um, African-Americans in blackface. And I, I found this quote um, and it, it's uh, by Chin, Chinwe Achebe. And he says, the whole idea of, stere of a stereotype is to simplify. And just this idea that you would reduce um, some a group of people down to the lowest possible um, denominator and not having the level of uh, giving, taking away their dignity, taking away, stripping them down to where they become a caricature, which is what this picture made me think of. Um, uh, if, if you're not familiar with the um, person who wrote this quote, um, uh, Chinwe Achebe is the author of Things Fall Apart, um, Nigerian author. Um, this next slide, um, I um, took something that was popular. And, and frankly, this does come from my childhood. Um, I, I'm sure that this version of um, Aunt Jemima was popular when I was a little girl. And the thing that is interesting about this for me is it's not one, I, I, I realize the stereotypical ways that this black woman is being depicted. And frankly, Aunt Jemima is the concept of a white, white male uh, person creating something for pancake mix. And this wasn't even based on a real person, but a, 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 a concept of what a black woman made domestic is supposed to look like. And for me, this is this could be my grandmother. And uh, frankly, um, thinking about the times that I grew up in, my grandmother um, was a domestic for many years and raised children, people's white families, children. So in the same context of what a person might picture um, this woman at, in doing cooking and cleaning and taking care of the children and running a household, this is, this is what my grandmother did. And in some ways, um, I don't look at her with disdain. I look at her with respect. And yet the people who invented this character, again, did not see the value of this person and the value of many black women who did these things for their day jobs. They cleaned and cooked 
and raise children and then only to go home and do the same thing, doing double duty as, as um, we talked about this um, in, in just thinking about the history of the black woman. And so she, to me, deserves so much of our respect and, and there, there is still that um, in many black women today is just that ethic of working um, to that extent. And so I think, and I think of her as a person that I would honor and a person of great strength. So going on to uh, a book that I saw um, in another curio had this, um, first of all, on the left side, you see children of different races and the commentary is having, uh, there's, there's commentary about what makes the skin of some people different color than others. And, you know, just this idea of um, the ways that many um, books that were out when I was young or even before my time would make these assertions about race that now we know um, kind of every everything that is stated probably in that to, to attach a person to a specific race can be refuted today based on what we know about race and the, con the social construction of race. And so the ways that our books kind of put us in categories and, and frankly, um, just kind of noting these five categories as this is all the races in the world, you know, kind of thing. When we know now that we're made up of many different um, our DNA will, would say we were, we're made up of many different races, in, and I use that in air quotes, but, but our makeup is in some ways similar. We just have different forms of melanin that make us different. But, but just this, this definitely resonated with me in the ways that we are now talking about race differently. And so going on to another form of racial identity, looking at these collectible dolls. And frankly, I, I probably had collectible dolls when I was a child, um, um, wanting to collect them all because that's what we do, right? As collectors. And so um, I think about the ways again, that the, the, if you look closely at these dolls, I probably should have um, zoomed in a little more, but the facial, the face, the way the faces are depicted are the stereotypical ways that you, um, you know that a, a person who created these dolls is trying to put them in a particular category. Um, the eyes have to look a certain way, the hair has to look a certain way, the clothing that the person is, the, the, the doll is wearing has to be the typical whatever from the, 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 um, the place where they are supposedly from. Um, and, and while some of that is harmless, again, it just continues to promote, this is what, this is the category, um, a person that looks like is supposed to be in. And so for me, um, again, it just reminded me so much of how we are put in these categories that we deign to not cross the lines to go into another category. And I think about the ways that our country is becoming, um, they, they call it the browning of America, where we are becoming more brown because we are intermarrying and our backgrounds are crossing different cultures. And so in, as we grow as a, as a country in the next 30, 40 years, we will have more of a larger um, population of biracial and, and multiracial children. 
and these these dolls will be very much a passe kind of thing to look at in terms of how we categorize people, if at all. And so in that way, I I can I know that um, this this was just something I thought of um, from way in my past. Um, but I'm I'm grateful to have had the opportunity um, to look at these. And then lastly, there is, a, I didn't take a, a great picture of it, but you can see this doll and it's, it's the Piccaninny. I don't think I ever even used that word in my whole life. I just know what it is, what, what, it, what a Piccaninny was described as. But this is a doll that came out of the whole, um, you know, uh, one of the ways that the the Piccaninny the Piccaninny was um, popularized was by Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harriet Beecher Stowe's uh, book, and one of the most famous um, was uh, uh, Topsy. But just thinking about this doll, it again just others the black child and the way that the black child is presented is e even this the the little dress that this doll is wearing is probably nicer than the typical doll would have normally have been because the the whole persona was tattered clothes the darkest darkest child hair strewn all over and again, same here. And so the, the point that, that I take from this is I am so grateful that we are teaching our children that every hue is, is beautiful. I think when, um, I think a lot of times when we look at something black, we think of it as negative. And in my, you know, in the ways that we look now, um, my hope is that we can see the beauty in darker skin. We can see the beauty in the hair, in the way that the hair is worn and that the hair does not have to assimilate to the dominant culture. And the ways that um, we look, we present, um, thinking about black children, the ways that, that they are presented all of it is beautiful and all of it has is redeemable. We're all redeemable, we're all valuable. Um, and so in some ways I look at this doll and I think this doll is, um, this doll has its own beauty and its own, um, it's to be treasured, but it was not looked at that way um, in those times. Um, so these are the these are the pieces that spoke to me and resonated with me, and um, I am grateful to have had this opportunity to share this with you. And I will stop by sharing my screen now. Uh, th thank you for sharing, Cheryl. Um, our next presenter is uh, Ray Elias, and he is a uh, retired uh, Newton High School art teacher and local historian. And I will get his slides up here for all of us. I think we are good to go, Ray. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I just recently was able to visit the exhibit once again uh, that you opened it up. I was also able to um, view it when it first opened and uh, luckily my uh, daughter actually worked on it too. So I always felt there was a, a certain connection and even some of the pieces on the exhibit were uh, from my house, uh, from some of our collection. Um, I, I think the one thing that uh, I find interesting in between the uh, aspects of what we're looking at from the historical part here is that the images that I'm going to talk about come from um, Mexico predominantly, but there's a big difference in what um, we just saw with uh, the African American community and then what we'll see with the Native American community. I think a big factor there is that 
they had no control on what was being produced and how they were being portrayed in society. So whether it was the, the entertainment images or the uh, painting images, any kind of image that came out was not controlled by them. They had no means of, of producing whatever characters that they were. But from the Mexican aspect of this exhibit, I saw that a lot of it came from uh, its, its point of origin, in other words, from Mexico. So like the first slide that shows the uh, dancers, that was, that was a, a, a panel that was displayed there. And this is, this is like traditional um, imagery that you would find everywhere in Mexico. Uh, dancers, you know, my wife actually uh, has a dance troupe and they dance traditional dances of Mexico. So seeing that image, you know, even used in, in, uh, in promoting uh, anything, whether it, it was um, materials or, or a product, and that doesn't jump out at me as being anything wrong. Um, the same with the this next little guy, the uh, puppet. I mean, it's almost like it, it comes from an era. It's almost no different than uh, the famous cowboys that came out in the 30s and 40s. In fact, I remember my father always talking about he loved going to the, the movies back when, you know, movies were like a nickel and uh, seeing his favorite cowboys. And in Mexico, they have that same kind of reverence for cowboys, except they're the original cowboys. So once again, this little marionette guy, he doesn't, it's almost like that traditional thing that was brought home every time somebody went to Mexico, they're bringing back a product made in Mexico to represent Mexico, even as, as uh, cute or clownish as it can be, it still is a way to represent them. So I, I also think that some of those items that were at the, at the exhibit were brought back, not in any, any real intent to demean. And I also think that the images that they, that they produce uh, weren't meant to demean. I think they were just trying to highlight uh, those cultural aspects. And the same with the little girl that says Mexico on it. I mean, once again, that's just a traditional little doll. My wife was a doll collector and, uh, in her younger years, and uh, she collected a number of dolls, Mexican dolls, uh, American dolls, just uh, for that good while. So once again, people were collecting dolls from different regions. Mexico happened to be one of those. Once again, not any kind of, to me, misrepresentation. If there is any uh, misrepresentation, it's really in, and this is now, this is something that is almost uh, a, a racial thing in Mexico. And I think even in the African American community, there is always that uh, portrayal of light skin and dark skin. And traditionally, uh, the dolls that you'll see, and that's, this can even be in the dancers, they'll traditionally be light skinned. And that's even though in Mexico you have the whole range of skin color, because you have the old native, the original natives of the country that were there before the conquistadores came. And so that that is just one little thing that if there was something to point out, that would be something that's uh, kind of obvious on when you look at things like dolls. But if you look at the puppet guy, he's, he's really got that skin tone color. Like he's like the traditional Mexican, um, you know, and even with my mustache, he's got the mustache too. So there's that kind of traditional aspect, uh, aspect to that. The next slides, um, the sleeping Mexican. <clears throat> you know, this is one of those things that, um, once again, it comes from Mexico. It isn't like it was produced here, and they said, this is what we think of as uh, Mexicans, as being lazy, as, as not wanting to work. Whereas in Mexico, it can be seen in a number of ways. One, it can just, one, it, I mean, if you want to look at the historical thing of it, it's almost like... Um, to me, it reminds me of the natives that were there, the original natives, and how they um, enslaved them to a certain degree and make them work and produce, um, become common laborers. And so they were working them almost like mules. So to see them resting and uh, needing a break after a long day of maybe hard labor and no pay, to me, that's not that unusual to see those kind of images. Um, 
And once again, I have that in my collection because we don't see that so much as derogatory. But it can be considered derogatory depending on how you um, share it with the community. So if you go to slide uh, seven, can you see that, Dan? Slide seven, yeah, I need a drink too. Um, let's see. It's the one that says hot taco. And it's the one right before that. Yeah, okay. So here, here is where it kind of takes a different turn. This is kind of like an image of, uh, uh, this is a, um, a restaurant, I think it was in Carolina or someplace. And um, this, is a, this is an example where uh, a restaurant has opened up and has used this imagery, uh, this sculpture of the sleeping Mexican. But it caused such a controversy because it was like the, the depiction of, of how it shows the Mexican really is kind of a little bit more insulting. It doesn't seem like he's a working man. Uh, you know, there's, there's the type on his hat that says he's, uh, you know, he's promoting the hot taco restaurant. And it's, and it's technically not to me, a true Mexican restaurant. I mean, to me, yes, it serves Mexican food, but that doesn't mean that it's a Mexican restaurant. And so there was controversy over this where there was actually a petition put together to, try, to, to, to uh, have this restaurant remove that character because for some of the people in the, in the Hispanic community, they found it offensive. So here you take something that was traditionally, just like I spoke earlier of the, of the sleeping Mexican, that, that was fine. And then you uh, kind of like uh, bump it up to an even higher kind of demeaning character. So whereas he's just some uh, symbol of a sleeping person, now he becomes more like a, um, I don't know, in a sense a degrading kind of personality. So there was issue with that. And what I find ironic about this is that this same restaurant, if you go to the next slide, then this is the interior uh, part of the building. And they do this beautiful, to me, I mean, if you're going to promote something that is traditional in Mexico, then you promote, then here's this matador with a, uh, with a bull, a toro, and he's, and it's, it's like in the most beautiful kind of content with the, with the traditional uniform, with the, with the facial expression, with the person actually being a traditional kind of uh, matador or uh, matador, as I would say, I guess in English. And, uh, and it just has such a contrast between the two from the outside feeling kind of like if you wanna go in that restaurant to come in there, I could almost say, oh, that's, pretty, that's a pretty cool um, promotion of, of the culture right there. But once again, uh, depending on how you, where you produce it, like I wouldn't think that the Mexican guy on the outside is made in Mexico. I think he would have that more of a, of a, of a more um, appropriate look to him, not necessarily that demeaning kind of look to him. So that's kind of what I found kind of interesting about that. And once again, it, it is a matter of where it's produced that, that is a factor in that. And then the next slide. Ah, tequila. I mean, you know, there's, there's certain ways that you can, um, promote a product. And once again, I think this is something that comes from Mexico that is uh, almost like, uh, well, I, I don't necessarily think it's meant to demean, but in the end, that's what it is. It's kind of like the standard drunk. To me, it's no different than the, than the uh, drunk hillbilly. Uh, something that comes from America, you have drunk hillbillies and, you know, you get a laugh at that because you have that certain kind of a uh, they have that certain kind of look to them. And I think this is the same thing. But Mexico is really actually uh, famous for its product of tequila. And, and in America, they even have now tequila bars that I find uh, fascinating that you can go in there and, and every kind of tequila. But they promote it in a much better way than I think this is promoted. So, And uh, once again, uh, a product of Mexico, uh, not the best promotion of it, I think. And then the next thing I was going to talk about, 
Yeah, and they, to me, these are just, you know, the traditional kind of things that come from Mexico that are brought over as collectors, um, you know, from the sleeping Mexican to just the little charitos right here, or the little uh, charros are the, uh, the men and women in their traditional uh, costumes, but made kind of like with the products of the local Indians there. And then the next one. And then I'm, I'm, I just wanted to touch base on this a little bit because I think this, this dialogue, Sorry Not Race, was kind of like uh, looking at how culture is promoted and uh, the history of what are we trying to actually identify in here. And I, I just like this. This is just like a tablecloth. And I just think it's, it, it's interesting because it covers a lot of the facets that you could have with those other little things. And it's, it's just a tablecloth, but it has those traditional things that kind of simple, that identify Mexico. And, and to me, the central figure in there is the, uh, is the vaquero or the cowboy, but the Mexican cowboy. And so here he is surrounded by the guitarra or the guitar. You got the, the uh, uh, matador, you got the sombreros, you got the serapes. To me, they're kind of like the traditional things that once again, tourists would collect and bring back from uh, Mexico and could have ended up in the uh, in the in the, the store, but they're not. They do not denote any of that kind of uh, um, racist connotation to them. And then the next one, and once again, because he's the cowboy, I just think that from a historical perspective, there's that aspect of the American cowboy has really his roots in the Mexican cowboy. And I think there's, there's this great sculpture by um, in, in Washington, D.C. of this sculpture of, of a vaquero. And it's in front of the American Museum. And what, what they're doing is they're paying homage to the American cowboy by using a Mexican cowboy or a Mexican vaquero. But the, but the Mexican cowboy was also, if he's the American cowboy, the American cowboy came in every other color too. He was white. He was brown and he was black. And, and those are little facets to me of the history that uh, sometimes get pushed to the wayside. And I think it's always just nice that if we're talking about race and culture and those images that come from Mexico, to me, this has always been one image that has always hit home with me the hardest. And, um, and then the next slide, uh, 13. Okay, so to me, the newest kind of collection that comes out of Mexico is uh, um, those influences. I mean, you, you've seen the sleeping uh, Mexican, you got the tequila uh, drunk guy, or you got the guy in the burro. But to me, the latest wave of things that I, I think have, have kind of almost flooded the United States is somebody like Frida Kahlo. Frida Kahlo is, is a, 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 a woman artist. And I think that's one aspect that's very important that a woman has this great influence on not just in Mexico or, or Latin America, but on, on the whole world in a sense, and especially in North America and the United States. And she has such an impact that she's uh, revered by a lot of women artists because I think that that plays a great part in promoting not just men artists, but women artists as a whole too. And then the next slide, and then the, to me, the, the latest rage, and I, I'd say probably for about the last good 20 years, even though I go back further, about 40 years when I was in San Francisco, is Day of the Dead. Is Day of the Dead has become a big influence here in the United States. And um, my wife has always done uh, altars at the church. Uh, she's been doing altars for a number of years. And then with the, with the movie Coco coming out and kind of giving it an Americanization telling of the history of, of Dia de los Muertos. It's something that still kind of resonates today. And the image on the right, that's a, that's a shelf at Walgreens. You go in there and, and Walgreens is selling Day of the Dead material from, uh, and not necessarily made in Mexico now that it's also even made here. So to me, those are just the kind of the, the things that I find that have, uh, that I got out of the uh, sorting out a race um, exhibit. So I want to stop it there. Because I, I didn't want to go into the other, I, I just didn't want to continue on to that. I think I can leave that for discussion a little bit more.
Thank you, Ben. You are you are welcome, and thank you. Um, let me just get prepared here. Okay, our next presenter um, is Leah Lawrence, and I will get my screen shared here for you. Just one second. Okay. All right. Well, hello, everyone. It's good to be here this evening, and I'm thrilled to be here with Cheryl and Ray and Andy and I'm thankful for the work that Dan, you and or that Dan and Sam, you guys are doing to help this conversation along. Uh, um, so this all started for me in 2008 um, when I picked up a job managing my absolute favorite thrift store. Let's see if I can. There we go. So for the Newton area folks joining us this evening. Hopefully you know about the Etc. shop. If you don't, you should check it out. Um, so I, when I got this job, I, I soon became the entertainment at my family gatherings, recounting the inventories of all the weirdest donations we had gotten, like a petrified mouse, used tea bags, love letters, you know, like this is some good stuff, people. Uh, we got the most fascinating boxes and bags. Some were almost like time capsules and some were basically garbage. We knew that we, and, and we knew the community by their things. One box or bag at a time, the stories were intimate and they were individual. A crafter with more supplies than energy, a person done with their diet and exercising books, uh, a person who had had multiple hospital stays, you know, like all the socks, all the hospital socks pouring in. But when considered together, we noticed that patterns emerged, patterns that said something about our community and the area. And I began to think of et cetera shop and thrift stores generally as ever evolving museums, speaking to us through the language of cast offs. But if they were just cast offs, not to be reabsorbed into the stream of daily life, their narrative would have been different. Instead, they were being snatched up quickly, um, purchased feverishly. And in our society, where we're taught that our very identities are shaped and confirmed by what we buy, these things told a story beyond the individual. In it, we found the forces shaping identity. And one story in particular made me sick. You can see here in this slide, a postcard that I think epitomizes the nature of what made me so sick. Vine Deloria Jr. calls it the white man's game. Bell Hooks says it's a narrowing down of how we think about things, similar to the quote you shared, Cheryl, to the next slide here. Raina D. Green calls it white people's all-consuming if unconscious quest to identify with royalty. Gord Hill calls it a strategy used to impose, impose capitalist ideology on people to pacify them and to portray them and to portray any struggle as doomed to failure. Harley Eagle calls it the dastardly plans of colonization, and I called it my new job. So let me back up and say, when I started as a manager, this thrift store had a policy of not censoring what it put out on the floor. If it was donated in good condition and legal for all of our customers, then we sold it for the most part. Um, the idea was that even if a sorter had a problem with mom jeans or big shoulder pads, or the messages that some things promoted, maybe a religious or political belief different from their own, the customer had a right to choose. And the proceeds from the sale of even problematic items went to a good cause. In that way, they became redeemed. And the reality was some of the most troublesome donations brought in a pretty penny. 
So then if we translate that into absurdity to illustrate the heart of it, if I throw away this highly collectible mammy salt shaker or Indian princess costume or blackface paint or a redskins jersey or a Nazi flag, a child might starve or peacekeeping efforts might falter for lack of funds or a community may not get fresh water. So more about the evolution in this thinking later because there certainly was a shift at our store. Back to the new job. At first, it was as censor. I started with a little stack of blackface and savage Indian caricatures on my desk. Some sheet music, like the one we see here. A photo of black-faced white school children from the 30s. Souvenir postcards that portrayed indigenous people as savages, pagans. Things I found so offensive, I felt an ethical obligation to pull them from our shelves. Already we were trying to address racist modes of operating that made many of our customers feel unwelcome, racial profiling, the only bilingual sign being the one about shoplifting, etc. Allowing uncontextualized racist caricatures into the mix, I thought would have worked against the just environment we were hoping for. When an Aunt Jemima and Uncle Moe's salt and pepper shaker were donated, I got a box. When the box got full, I called Kaufman Museum. Would you take these? I implored. I could understand their value within an educational context or for reappropriation, but I felt really uncomfortable with the idea of these things floating free for just anyone to snatch up. Um, and my experience was the people snatching them up were often the antique store dealers um, who knew that they could turn this around for a lot more money themselves. A lot of white men and women. Um, so we had a volunteer shuttle these things over to the Kaufman Museum. Other staff got in on the action and we started a new box. And I began imagining what Kaufman Museum might do with these boxes. And that imagining led to an idea. And by the time I proposed this exhibit to their director, we had pulled hundreds of artifacts. This was when our rather limited role as censors began broadening. Out of necessity, we had to educate ourselves, staff, volunteers, board members, learning to identify not just the explicitly racist caricatures and ideas, but the covert ones as well. The managers began ha having hard, hard conversations what role should censorship play in this environment? What's our goal with this project? Can we even agree? We attended an anti-racism and anti-oppression training together led by Roots of Justice. We responded to hostility and skepticism from our white volunteers, from some of our white volunteers. Others met this project with enthusiasm. We processed the emotional implications this system of analysis stirred up in ourselves, ranging from guilt to excitement, fear, curiosity, anger, sadness. The board formally committed to the project, though some had misgivings, believing that focusing on race drew people away from their common identity as Christians. So um, essentially white Christian colorblindness was our point of resistance in that conversation. Meanwhile, we were pulling so many things from the donation stream that I had to make weekly deliveries to the museum. So, I mean, this gives you an idea of the scope of, <laughs> the scope of messaging in our homes and in our lives, just from like how much we were receiving. When we exceeded 500 items, we slowed the calling way down, only pulling the most compelling examples of racism. And during this time, the museum director, Rachel Pannebecker, and I were discussing the exhibit's conceptual framework and mission. I asked that the exhibit do the following. Explicitly promote the dismantling of racism, feature a multi-level analysis of racism from the inter and intrapersonal to the institutional and cultural, answer some basic questions about race, racism and stereotypes, 
to establish a common language with the visitor, tell the story in a way that reveals our local reality as well as the larger national and global forces at play, and root accountability to people of color within a powerful and widely representative reference council. So it's 2020. By now, sorting out race has been on display across the United States for the better part of the last five and a half years. And Andy can speak more to this, but I believe it's won at least one award. Um, visitors have gotten to look into these manufactured faces with questions that lead to more truthful answers, I think. Who were you made for? Why were you made? What was happening around you that birthed the idea of you? How have people been using you? What liberation do you crave? What liberation has already been achieved? So these questions and these faces have remained with me some more clearly defined than others over the years. <laughs> many years since this project began. And um, when an NPR article on the racist origins of the commonly known ice cream truck song popped into my Facebook feed a number of months ago, I remembered this sheet music and realized how intimately I was connected to it. So Turkey in the Straw was given new lyrics in the early 1800s. Um, to promote um, to promote racist ideology, essentially. Um, the lyrics are available online if you want to go check that out, but I didn't just didn't want to touch it tonight. Um, this became especially popularized in the late 1800s in the 1890s when um, during reconstruction, ice cream parlors began playing this particular version of Turkey in the Straw that had um, revised lyrics. And so here I have a picture of what used to be et cetera shop, the very same building, the F.W. Woolworths and Company building on Main Street in Newton. Um, and I, I think when I realized the connection that this Turkey in the Straw song may well have been played over the speakers at the counter, at the lunch counter in the Woolworth store, and then to have the sheet music return to the store again, and then to have examined the history of it, to have lived as a kid in Newton hearing the ice cream truck pass by to have developed a nostalgia around that song and then to have discovered its or its roots in such a despicable past um, was stunning to me so often i know at least for myself as a white person it's really easy for me to make this an academic exercise and to place the attention on um, what's most visible the, the racist oppression. What becomes harder is to link myself personally into the story, um, even though I know that I have been awash in these messages, these images, this ideology my whole life. It's hidden, it's so often hidden. And I think the real value of this exhibit is to draw us into these spaces where we find ourselves connecting with things that we are familiar with that have been the very stuff of our lives since childhood. One of the conversations that we had when, um, when conceptualizing what we wanted to do with the exhibit and our what we wanted our focus was, uh, what we wanted our focus to be was to really process this reality that presenting people with racist stereotypes actually has the effect of continuing to promote those racist stereotypes. 
we can dig, we can uncover, we can understand more, but until we start reframing, until we start reclaiming and recasting the images and showing something different, the neurological pathways that recycle these ideas over and over are gonna have a hard time adjusting. So what I like to remember is that resistance has been happening all along the way. All of the images that have been shown tonight that are rooted in racist ideology are ones that people have been fighting against since the very beginning. Um, and it's not a lighthearted thing, it's soul work for individuals and for our whole society. Um, but I wanted to end with this little jingle that an ice cream company and um, a musician and an artist collaborated on out of their understanding of the racist origins of Turkey in the Straw. Um, so I'll just play this little clip for you and that'll be it for me. And then I think we can move into question time. I don't know if we have sound on. Not hearing it, but. Not hearing it. Well, um, maybe we can send the link out. Just so you know, there are people using their genius and their creativity to fight racism at every turn, even creating a new ice cream truck song. So there, go out and find it. All right, Sam, do you wanna do the question and answer section with me? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I've got, um, oh, let me start my video up again. Okay, I've got, um, I've got we've got Facebook and, um, and our Zoom uh, pulled up. So um, folks, if you just wanna type, um, Type in, in the chat if you've got uh, questions or comments for the for the the panelists or and you know any of us to talk about and and um, I yeah I want to also say thank you by the way that all three of those uh, presentations were really interesting and and um, enlightening um, so I guess if if uh, you know if you all have questions for each other that's great too and um, let's get the let's get the conversation part going a little bit. Um, I guess while we're, we're waiting for some folks to, to formulate their questions, um, yeah, you know, talk uh, interesting talking about turkey and the straw. Um, I, w I came across a, um, a, a a book of um, a Stephen a Stephen Foster songbook that looked like I think it was published in 1940, and um, it had been recently withdrawn from our library because it was in poor condition and nobody had checked it out. But that was really, um, you know, to look through this songbook, which I, I think it, it explained in the intro that some of the most, some of the most racist comment or most racist content of Foster's original songs had been revised or removed. But if you look at what's left, it's still not, not really acceptable by today's standards at all. It's, it's very much that gone with the wind um, style fantasy. And you know, it's just, um, yeah, I, I think that that's, that's what, that's what people grapple with because it's like, you know, this, this book might've been something that was a treasured family songbook for somebody singing Jeannie with the light brown hair or whatever, but then you look at it through today's eyes and it's, you know, it, it's, it's also a part of a legacy of, uh, of racism. So I guess that that, you know, if you, I'm curious, um, Leah and Leah and Andy. I guess what what kind of conversations have you had with people that have come, maybe, maybe at the exhibit or something? You know, what the conversations with people about their own lives, like you were, and and how these objects connect with them personally. I I can comment on that, and i don't think i introduced myself earlier but i'm andy schmidt anderson i work at kaufman museum and uh 
the exhibit's up right now. And so even just recently, I've been having conversations with people and there's actually this nostalgia, um, Leah, and people, um, you know, being taken back to memories. One that keep, people keep bringing up is there's a Little Black Sambo book right in the front case of the exhibit. And so many people talk about having owned that book or had that book um, and it reminds them of their childhood. And just for them to even stop and think uh, and think about that in a whole new way um, is a good thing. But it, every single time I'm in the exhibit or with someone, uh, they usually wanna comment on an item. They usually wanna recall an experience with a certain item. So inevitably there are conversations happening happening and much of the exhibit has um questions each of the exhibit areas have different questions what is what is race um what is systemic racism um different things like that and so it, it really has started small conversation just one-on-one -on -one in the exhibit and then conversations like this and then we've had other programming when the exhibit was here before uh, and we hope conversations all around the country. It's been at about 10 other museums everywhere from, oh, California to Indiana, I think is the farthest east. So it's been a lot of different places and we hope started conversations at a lot of different places. And I, I can just about guarantee anybody visits the exhibit, they'll immediately um, start reflecting on their own lives or thinking of uh, their own questions that it brings up and that, that has happened for me too, um, just day in and day out. I don't know yeah. if you wanted to say anything about that, Leah, or not. Yeah, um, okay, well, um, we've got a question from uh, Barbara on the Facebook. Uh, she asked, is there a gold standard of anti-racism training that our schools are using? or maybe to add to her question, maybe that they should be using. Um, uh, Cheryl, do you, know, do you know about that? Or, or thoughts on, thoughts on anti-racism training in schools? I, I mean, when we talk about it at KIPCOR, because we, one of the things that we do is we train educators in um, restorative practices. And one of the things that we are talk about um, in relationship to the implementation of restorative practices, which is not the end all for um, school discipline or to create a, a healthy school. One of the other components of that is give, creating an, a, a group of educators who also have been trained in anti-racism. Um, we know that for many people, they can implement a strategy without thinking about who they're possibly impacting and the ways that their biases play into it, the ways that um, their prejudices exist and still do a, you know, there, there still could be ways that restorative justice can be implemented without that but it will not be the way that it will, that will not be what transforms a school. What will transform a school is we start with where these educators are at. And that, and part of it is dismantling some of them, some of the ways that they've been um, all conditioned to teach um, from the trajectory of whatever they were raised with without coming into what is a common way that we need to be thinking about how we need to treat each other. And so the only way that that happens is by dismantling that through anti-racism training. There are, I think, lots of good organizations doing that work that are offering those trainings that one that I think the Newton community is very familiar with is through an organization called Roots of Justice. And they have worked with educators here, um, there in Newton. And um, I don't know if there are educators in the audience, if that's where this question is coming from, but for those who may have already developed some understanding of anti-racism, 
and had some training. Teaching Tolerance, put out by the Southern Poverty Law Center, is a wonderful resource for teachers. They provide lots of curricular material and, um, and they link it into the this educational standards that teachers need to be mm -hmm. so consumed with and often get name as one of the reasons they can't veer away from the traditional curriculum. So teaching tolerance has done the work of merging those two priorities for teachers so they can just take it right into the classroom. Now, they also have to have some personal capacity to understand what they're doing to deal with the nuance involved in teaching that and responding to students in the moment. But um, yeah, there's lots of good stuff out there. Yeah, there's, and there, um, to, for this community, Roots of Justice um, does a great job of giving those foundational um, ways that um, the the training can can work in 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 connection with other things that um, educators can do, um, and so for that um, we are equipping a new breed of teachers that are more informed. I think, I think it, it really connects to a lot of the things that we talk about um, in education around socio-emotional development. I also think that um, it, it speaks to trauma-informed. You can also see that in the, uh, at, well, I'm just speaking for Newton High School, but um, they allowed the students to actually promote um, discussions like that and actually form groups. Now, we ran the, uh, we sponsored the Azteca Club, which was dealing with uh, Hispanic issues. But if students came to the uh, school, I mean, the principal and proposed one, um, and they, they would find a sponsor, they were allowed. So they even had a lesbian, gay, um, um, LGBTQ. A group put together as long as it was a teacher willing to sponsor it and give those kids a voice in the community there at the school. So I think that's kind of like from the student perspective, at least being able to um, uh, be able to address those issues that uh, they were dealing with. Um, here's a question from Carolyn. Uh, is the et cetera shop continuing to remove racist or inappropriate items? And if so, what is being done with them now? I do not know the answer to that. And I don't know if you do, Leah. And I don't know if there's anybody watching from et cetera shop right now. They might be able to speak to that better than either of either of we can. Yeah, it's been years since I've been involved in the day-to-day -day workings of et cetera. So I'm not sure what they're doing. However, I do know that um, nationally, the MCC thrift stores have worked to promote a set of standards that encourage um, individual thrift stores to pull out items that explicitly promote messages of hate and violence. So now, whether the sorter's capacity to recognize the subtlety in some of the message, you know, like sometimes it's very hard to know what you're looking at. And so some things may sneak through, one sorter may have a, a greater sensitivity to things or greater awareness, greater like more experience analyzing this than another sorter. And so if you find yourself in, a, in an MCC thrift store or for that matter, any sphere of public life and you find something racially offensive, Go to the manager, tell them, I have a problem with this. I think this is racist. I don't wanna see this in this store. Now, you'll learn a lot about your community by how that manager responds to that situation. Um, and it's also a great opportunity for you as a community member to flex your anti-racism muscle, to start practicing speaking about your conviction in simple ways. I mean, it's, it's a rather simple thing just to tell a store manager, I don't wanna see this here. But um, that comfort with speaking out will grow as you do it. And it does matter to your community. It does matter to the managers to start hearing how their customers are being impacted. Some people would just have no idea. Other, yeah. I don't think many people are being ex malicious if these things are going out. Um, 
it, there's likely a lot of ignorance involved. However, that doesn't excuse it. It needs to change. It needs to stop. I'll just add, there was a response in the chat that Newton, et cetera, shop is continuing to re remove the items. So thank you to Joy Yoder who added that, that they are, are still removing them. Now, I don't know for sure what's being done with them. And there was also a, a comment up in the a couple higher that the thrift shop, a, a thrift shop in Goshen was wondering what to do with the items that they had called and one idea they thought about was um, breaking some of it up and making a mosaic, making something beautiful out of it. So, um, you know, that's been a discussion at Coffin Museum too. Uh, we can only store so much and what do we do with the items? So that's an ongoing discussion. We had um, Raw Tools here uh, last year. Uh, Raw Tools does a great job of taking, for some people who no longer want to have guns in their lives, um, they have taken guns and fashioned them into garden tools. And in the same way, I could see a lot of those uh, pieces that come, um, however they, they show up in, in these different thrift stores, that would be a great idea to turn them into something different, to repurpose these items in positive ways. Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, I was kind of thinking um, the, you know, the, the, as a public library, um, you know, we, 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 we have a policy that we, we do not, you know, we do, we do not censor. Um, of course, we, when, we're, when we're buying new materials, we, we use our professional judgment about whether these have any quality or, or, or value for the community. Um, but we, you know, we don't censor uh, based on viewpoint. So, you know, it's just, it's just something to, to, to note. I think it, it's, it's, a, it's a bit different and, and so, I, I'm thinking of if, if somebody were to walk up to our circulation desk and saying, you know, I, I don't think this book is harmful. I don't think you should have it in the library. I mean, we do have a process to challenge that. Uh, uh, you know, there's a, a form that people can fill out and a policy in place for a book being challenged and, and, and that goes into effect. But, but you know, like that, that um, Stephen Foster songbook I mentioned earlier, it, it was withdrawn not because of its content per se, but because nobody was checking it out and because it was in poor condition. Um, so I think that as a, as a library, you know, our, what we need to, we need to focus on, you know, facilitating conversations like this, you know, doing other things to promote uh, racial justice inequality and also you know, be mindful of those um, free speech and principles and intellectual freedom principles that are also uh, very important. So I guess that's not really a <laughs> that's not really a question, but just a just a comment. Um, well, I guess um, I think that um, I don't I don't see anything else outstanding here that that we haven't uh, talked about with the group here. Do any do you any of you have any other comments or or thoughts for uh, for one another? I'm just grateful to have had the opportunity to present with both of you, Ray and Leah. Thank you so much, Andy, Sam, and Dan. Thank you for putting this together. Um, it's been a great night. Thank you all for for participating and, and being here with us tonight. It was very wonderful. Yes, indeed. Yeah, thank you all very much. Okay, well, we will, um, we will sign it off then. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.